If you are worried you have Lyme disease, or just like the outdoors, and want the peace of mind of knowing whether you have Lyme disease or not, there is a new Lyme screening test based on decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at VCU Medical Center. For more information, visit glymedx.com. That's G-L-Y-M-E-D-X.com. Or email at info at glymedx.com. Infectious diseases, research, medicine, health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Hi everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. Now, on the show, today we've covered several different types of parasites on the podcast. Protozoa, tapeworms, and roundworms. Now, on today's episode of Parasites 101 on the podcast, we'll be looking at another soil-transmitted helminth, the hookworms. Joining me, as always, to answer some questions about the hookworm is parasitology teacher and author of Parasites, Tales of Humanity's Most Unwelcome Guest, Rosemary Drizdell. Hi, Rosemary. How are you doing this evening? Great, Robert. Glad to be back. Okay. Now... Hookworm is not a genus and a species, but a generic name for this group of nematodes. Rosemary, what are the hookworms? Hookworms are little roundworms. They're quite small, maybe about a quarter to a half an inch in length, so visible to the naked eye, but you might not notice them. And the reason we call them hookworms is because there are several different species that infect humans, so it's kind of a catch-all name to refer to all of them at once. Now, unlike the other soil-transmitted helminths, like Ascariasis that we talked about earlier, um, in which humans become infected when ingesting in, uh, infected eggs, um, this is not the same story for hookworm, is it? No, it's not. The hookworms actually infect people by penetrating the skin. So if your skin comes in contact with the larvae that are present in the soil, they'll penetrate the skin and they do a little tissue migration, eventually ending up in the lungs. They get coughed up and swallowed, and from there they go to the small intestine and develop to adult worms. So it's a little different life cycle than the things that we get by swallowing them. And because it is skin penetration, is this more a disease of children than adults? or? Well, children are certainly um, more heavily infected, yes, and uh, may suffer more serious consequences of the disease. But really, anywhere where hookworm is endemic and human skin comes in contact with the soil, uh, mainly the tropics, even adults will easily become infected with hookworms. So it's not mostly a disease of children, no. Okay. Now, this is generally considered a disease of poverty. How much hookworm infection is reported annually worldwide, and what areas are most heavily affected? Well, as I mentioned, hookworm is a parasite of the tropics, and we do see perhaps 700 million or more people infected in tropical areas. It is a parasite that's very sensitive to extremes of temperature, so if it gets too hot or too cold or too dry or too wet, hookworm simply dies. It can't survive. So that's why we see most people who are infected live in the tropics. Now, um, there was a report out recently uh, where there was a study in Alabama, and they found hookworm infection um, in several dozen cases down there. And yes. It, and, and it surprised uh, the researchers. Um, Rosemary, can you talk briefly about the situation in Loundis County, Alabama? My understanding of that situation is that the people in that county have... Uh, proper sanitation. They have toilets, but these toilets don't necessarily go into a, a sanitary sewage system, so they may discharge onto the ground. And even though that's perhaps at some distance from their dwellings, you know, things do get spread around. Earthworms and animals and weather and water and all these things can spread things. So if, if the eggs are present in feces that are then deposited on the ground and then larvae hatch, 
it's still quite possible for people to come in contact with those larvae. And it may have surprised a lot of people that this was still around in Alabama after all these years, but it doesn't particularly surprise me. Because anywhere where there isn't a really good sewage system and feces can end up on the ground exposed to the air, you can get hookworm having quite a successful time infecting people. Now, hookworm uh, can be relatively asymptomatic with low, low burden infections, but it can cause a lot of pathology too. Rosemary, what are the signs and symptoms of hookworm? Yeah, there's a difference between hookworm infection and hookworm disease. So if you have a low number of the worms, you may not even know they're there. But if there are a lot of them, the major symptoms of hookworm disease are simply anemia because the worms attach to the lining of the intestine and they literally suck blood. So if you have a lot of worms, that can cause quite a profound blood and protein loss for, for the person. So your symptoms are going to be things like iron deficiency anemia, listlessness, pale skin, protein deficiency, sometimes a rather enlarged, rounded belly, which is a symptom of protein deficiency. So that's what hookworm will do over the, over the long term. Now, can you talk about the diagnosis and treatment of hookworm? Of course, if you have typical symptoms and you know that hookworm is endemic in an area, you may have a high level of suspicion just from the symptoms. But also, we can prove that hookworm is there by checking stool samples and looking for the characteristic eggs of the worm. It's quite easily treated, treated with albendazole or mebendazole, both very readily available, low-cost drugs. So it's relatively easy to treat if you know it's there. Now, since hookworm larvae penetrate the skin, uh, prevention must entail minimizing exposure of skin to the soil. Yes, and you would think that even just preventing that would be quite effective, but of course in tropical countries it's difficult to limit skin exposure to the soil. And so just doing that much, we used to think that providing everybody with shoes would protect them, but that wasn't terribly effective. Really the most effective thing is to prevent uh, contamination of the environment with human feces. That is the key to breaking the life cycle of hookworm, but even that is very difficult in some parts of the world. Now, in several countries, the government gives deworming medication to school children as prophylaxis without being diagnosed for hookworm. Uh, how does this work? That's right. Generally, the thought is that if you have a prevalence that exceeds about 50% in a population, you can go ahead and treat everybody without proving, you know, which individuals have it and which do not, because at that high prevalence, you know, everybody is pretty much going to be exposed. So that's what they generally do in those situations. Now, other than that, in countries where hookworm is prevalent, um, what public health actions are taken to prevent the population from getting infected? Yeah, again, often large-scale deworming programs. So the drugs that treat hookworm will also be effective against the other soil-transmitted helminths, especially Ascaris and Trichuris. Mm -hmm. So if you do a large-scale deworming program, you can lower the levels of infection for all of those uh, intestinal worms at once. Of course, there are efforts at increasing sanitation, and really, as you mentioned, it is a disease of poverty, so raising the economic status of the population is very effective as well. Um, now, to close, uh, Rosemary, what unique or strange tale do you have today about hookworm? Uh, there are so many to choose from. One could write a whole book about hookworm. can't imagine but, that. <laughs> yeah. But one I find particularly interesting is that Fossil human feces in North America have been found to contain hookworm eggs, and these predate the European colonization, so they're pre-Columbian. Now, the theory has been that people migrated to North America across the Bering Land Bridge, so a bridge of land that connected Alaska and Siberia. But because it is so sensitive to extremes of environment, hookworm couldn't have survived that journey. So the presence of hookworm eggs, fossilized hookworm eggs, predating the Columbian era, tells us that there must have been another route, something quicker and warmer, in order for hookworm to have come to North America. Hmm. It's very intriguing. Yes, it is.
All right. Well, you, you got me stumped again. Um, thank you again, Rosemary Drizdell, for another very informative interview. I appreciate it, ma'am. Always my pleasure. Thank you.